Have you ever had uh, at the beginning of a year uh, this moment where it really it's about new things? It's a new year, and so you're really thinking about what's new or what's going to be new. What was something I need to get rid of? What's something I need to add? I, I just love what a new year does to our thinking. I walked into my closet the other day and I just had this epiphany that uh, I looked at my clothes and I just realized there's probably half of them that I haven't worn in a year. So I spontaneously on the moment uh, took half of my wardrobe in my closet and, 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 and got rid of it by donating it away. And that whole process uh, got me thinking of about uh, how we need to take inventory on the things that we wear, and it, it and, and and not just in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense, there are things that we can accumulate in a year that that we may be wearing or we may be putting on on a regular basis that we don't need to wear anymore, and we need to to get rid of in in the new year. And I don't know if you, you're like me, but when you were uh, growing up, how many of you ever had this thing called hand-me-downs? If you're not familiar with that term, it's where you have like an an older sibling or uh, an older cousin, and when they outgrow their clothes because they're older, uh, people show up with trash bags and they and they they give you a whole bunch of of your cousins or your your siblings' clothes, and they were theirs, but now they've been passed down down to you. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, I don't remember shopping a whole lot. I, I just remember, man, hey, I, I in, inherited my cousins, my older cousins' clothes. I remember sometimes looking at him, and I'd be like, man, one day that's going to be mine. I can't wait to wear that. Come on, if you ever did the hand-me-downs, give me a clap. Give me something in the chat here. But this is all just uh, ruminating in my mind, and because of what I have been reading, uh, just verse I found in the book of Exodus. Exodus uh, 29, there's a description. God is setting everything up and he's describing not only the temple, but what the priests are going to wear as they fulfill their priestly function. There's a, a verse in Exodus 29, 5 through 9, and then in verse 29 as well, it says this. Then take the vestments and dress Aaron in the tunic, the robe of the ephod, the ephod and the breastpiece, Belting the ephod on him with the embroidered waistband, set the turban on his head and place the sacred crown on the turban. Then take the anointing oil and pour it on his head, anointing him. Then bring his sons, put tunics on them and gird them with sashes, both Aaron and his sons, and set hats on them. Their priesthood is upheld by law and is permanent. Aaron's sacred garments, dropping down to verse 29, are to be handed down to his descendants so that they can be anointed and ordained in them. So God is describing all the things that he's going to do, the things that they are to wear, but you can't throw them away, he says, because they're going to be handed down to his sons. And then in the book of Numbers, we see this echoed again. This is the end of Aaron's leadership in the scriptures. And he says, take Aaron, he's the first priest, and his son up the mountain. Take Aaron's clothes off and put them on his son, and then Aaron will die. Title of this sermon is Hand-Me-Downs. It's interesting that Aaron is handing down the tangible representation of his function, of his calling, of what he stood for and represented. He is handing down his clothes and all the symbolism behind it uh, to the next generation. And it got me thinking about what are we wearing that's going to be passed on to those we lead? What are we wearing in a spiritual sense that we're clothed in that someday will be picked up and worn by those who follow us, by our children uh, by our grandchildren, by by our teammates and those that are around us. And so I thought, what are some things that we can wear? Maybe uh, <clears throat> are we passing on a garment of peace or a garment of anxiety? Are 
we passing on um, a garment of prayer or a garment of bickering? Are we passing on a garment of forgiveness or a garment of bitterness? Are we passing on a garment of kindness or a garment of frustration, of faith or worry, of striving and always fighting, or one that's moving towards reconciliation? One who is being healed or one is always causing pain to others? See, in, in life, we get, here's the crazy thing, we get to choose what we wear. We get to choose what we put on and we get to choose what we take off. So this whole random verse that I read in the book of Exodus and Numbers, it really got me thinking about, well, what are some things the Bible says that we can be clothed in? And so I just made a simple list here. First one, uh, it says in 1 Peter uh, 5, 5, that we can be clothed in humility. In the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I love this. Uh, humility is a, is a spirit word. It is a fruit of the spirit. That means that there is a humility given to us that is uh, the catalyst of it is the working of the Holy Spirit in his life, in our life. And so humility is an earthy word. It is a low word. It hummus. It means the, the earth, the dirt. It means humility means uh, to get low, you know, and if we can get low in a spiritual sense and we can stay low, then what happens is grace will flow. Ooh, that'll rhyme right there. That'll preach. Get low, stay low and let grace flow. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, humility magnetizes, attracts, if you will, the grace of God his divine activity in our lives. And, but here's where humility will most often play out, play out, not just between us and the Lord, but humility is played out in relationships. Here it is in the context in the church setting between the young and the old. Let both parties clothe themselves in humility. There's always a tension. There can be a gap. There can be a difference in perspective and points of views. And what happens is, but if we will clothe ourselves in humility then we can honor one another and the grace of the Lord can flow in those relationships. I think about this. If, if, if we want God's grace to not flow in us, just flow in us, but in our relationships, then we have to walk in humility towards one another. We have to consider the others better even than ourselves. So one of the things we can do is we can clothe ourselves in humility. Second one is we can clothe ourselves in righteousness. Isaiah 61 says this, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and arrayed me in robes of his righteousness. Oh, I like that. The Bible says that when, before we came to Christ, that our righteousness was as his filthy rags. Think about that, that our righteousness, our own <clears throat> ability to be right and do right would before the Lord be like filthy rags. However, when we come into a relationship with, with Jesus Christ, the, with the Father through the Son, by the Holy Spirit, what happens is uh, we have reckoned to us, imputed upon us, the righteousness afforded to us by the Son of Jesus Christ, that he adorns us with beautiful garments. In fact, the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ and what he can do, God sees you through the lens and the perfection of the sun. And that's, that's, uh, there's two edges to, to righteousness. It's being right and doing right. And we'll talk about the doing right later. But this being right part, there's nothing we can do in our own strength and ability and our own credentials. We, in some instances, the scriptures say we're bankrupt. We don't have the ability to pay off our debt. But the scripture says it was reckoned to our account. It was deposited in our account. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we were made righteous. Our bank account got filled up. Think about spies in Cayman Islands when they're making those negotiations and they put in a code and, and some random bank account somewhere begins to fill up with millions of dollars. That's what I think about when I think about 
We are clothed in righteousness. My bank account has been filled. I am adorned with the garments of salvation. I can take off those old clothes and put on the robe of righteousness. Here's another one. is freedom. In the book of John 11, there's this great story of a guy named Lazarus who died. He's been dead four days and Jesus comes and raises him from the dead. It says when he had said this, uh, Jesus said in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. I mean, come out of that grave. The dead man came out, his hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. I look, I look at this in the sense of he was resurrected. He was come out of a grave, but yet he was still clothed in grave clothes. And he'd been dead four days. So those clothes, man, they stunk. He, I'll say it in churchy language, and, and he was redeemed. He had been resurrected, and he was had walked out of a grave. That's salvation. He had been redeemed, but yet he was still clothed in some things that he needed to be released from. You see, our salvation in one instance is instantaneous. We have been born again, and that's a beautiful thing. But our salvation is being worked out in a progressive manner. We have been saved and we are being saved. Paul said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. All of us, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we've been saved. We're born of the Spirit. We've been resurrected in a, in, in a sense. However, we still got some grave clothes. We get, still got some things that stink. We got some attitudes that think. We got some thinking that stinks. We got some habits that stink. And we need to take those things off and, and, and put on some, some, some new clothes, if you will. And here's a thought. There are some things that I, in my past, that I am a product of. I am a product of my past. But when I came to Jesus Christ, I am no longer a slave to my past. I have been redeemed, and now I am being released from it. Ooh, come on. How many of you believe that? Say amen to that. Come on. I am clothed in freedom. I don't have to wear the grave clothes anymore. I don't have to think like that, do that, and have that happen. I have a freedom that comes to me. The next one is this I call, this is a confidence. And, 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 and this comes from 1 Samuel 17. This is the story of David. You probably heard the story of David versus Goliath. This is that moment when he's about to go out and fight him and the king saws clothing him in all of his armor and getting ready to go off out and listen to this conversation. So Saul clothed David with armor and his bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. And David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not te tested them. So David took them off. Mm. And here's the word. I have here is confidence. And the word I, I use here is confidence, but really what I mean is faith. I just use confidence because that's a word that we can uh, really, uh, in our vernacular, really understand a little bit more. But really what I'm talking about is faith. And, you know, uh, the verse before this, David says, the Lord has rescued me from the paw of the bear and paw of the lion, and now the Lord will rescue me again from this giant. I, I love that story. He has rescued me before and he will rescue me again. And, and, and you know, when you think about that, there is, um, uh, there is this thing we, we can grow in and it's called growing in our faith. You know, think about there's levels to faith and it starts out with a, a lion. It starts out with a bear and then it, and it gets a little bit more and moves to a giant. But along the way, there's all kinds of methodologies. There's all kinds of things that will tempt us to put our trust in. But they have not been tested. They have not been proven. And it's so easy to adopt the, 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 the strategies and the systems and the, and, the, and the things of this world. But the reality is we are a faith people. And we obey. Uh, we, we lean into and obey our strategy and our our, our strategies and our hopes and our confidence is not rooted in the things of this world, but it is rooted in the word of God. 
And when we obey that and we take steps to that and we've seen God, I, I give and I've seen God provide. I've obeyed and I've seen God delivered. I've tested that and I'm going to walk in that. And listen, Saul represents a world system. It's it's a way of thinking that doesn't include God. And it's always trying to put things on you. And so if we can take those things off and, and often it's fear driven. And the, the language of the world is, is almost always fear and scarcity. But God never speaks the language of fear. He always speaks the language of, of, of faith. And we can be tempted to put on something that's not of the word and not of God. And it will take it off. Listen, they put it on armor when all we really need is a sling. Because David would take the sling and the stones and slay Goliath. I can have confidence in the word of God and how God has worked in my life in the past. And I can use that with confidence and move towards. So sometimes we just need to put on confidence and faith and stare down the giants we're facing. Here's another one. We can put on power. We can be clothed in power. Luke 24, 49, I am going to send to you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. I love that. It is power from another location. It is a power that comes from a high place, not a low place. It comes from there to here. And that word clothed means equipped. It means endued. It means empowered with the person of the Holy Spirit. And so many times we can sit there and think that it, you know, in the kingdom of God, it's not introvert and extrovert. It's not our giftings, but really it's our spiritual authority. We operate under the cover, under the influence, and under the power that comes from the person of the Holy Spirit. And to be clothed with means I have come under the influence of and found a way to attach myself to the person of the Holy Spirit. I am clothed with power from on high. Now you maybe see, Pastor Ricky, why you're talking about all of these things. Because we as a church are getting ready, starting in February, to enter into 21 days of prayer and fasting. Where as a church, collectively, we're going to participate in a Daniel fast. That's where we eat fruits and vegetables and certain grains and meats. And largely, we will um, <clears throat> will fast as a church. And a, and, a, and, a, and a spirit of sacrificial prayer. We're not manipulating God, but what we're doing is we're practicing a biblical means of grace so that we can focus our prayers and focus our minds and focus our hearts at the beginning of the year on the Lord. And the Bible talks about that in a spirit of fasting. And really the heart of fasting is anything that I give up to get closer to the Lord. You can sacrifice you can sacrifice TV, social media. You can, in fact, sacrifice all kinds of different things. But a biblical fast has to do and center around food. And so we practice the Daniel fast that's in the book of Daniel for 21 days. He had a different diet and he sought the Lord. There's more about that online. And you can download all kinds of prayer helps and information on fasting on, on our website. But the key part of this is that we would do this collectively as a church, 21 days, to center the activity of our, of our families, of our individual lives, and our church around the presence of God. But fasting accelerates and helps clothe us in every single one of the, and the, uh, the categories that I just talked about. I'll quickly go through these. Let me think, when we clothe ourselves in humility, it has to do with fasting. Daniel 9 and 3, so I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petitioned him in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. Fasting is a way to humble ourselves before the Lord. It promotes and fosters the spirit of humility. That's what it does. And that's why I love, if you're saying, hey, how do I clothe myself in humility? Prayer is the verb form of humility. And when we fast and pray, it accelerates and increases and fosters the spirit of humility. It clothes us in humility. Here's another one, righteousness. Clothed in righteousness, Psalms 35, 13. I'm mortified. I put to death myself, my flesh, with fasting. You know, we talked about how there's two sides to the righteous, righteousness. There's the imputed um, part, that is, being right. Our bank accounts are now filled 
But then there's also the moral courage to do right. And fasting has to do with both of those. The fasting, have you ever had, uh, you wanted to do the right thing, but you felt powerless to do the right thing? What I have found in my life is that fasting does these things. It helps me. The Bible talks about inside of us is a war between the flesh and the spirit. I want to do it, but I feel powerless to do it. <clears throat> but I need the spirit's help. They are at enmity at war within me, the flesh and the spirit. And what fasting does is it starves the fat, flesh and feeds the spirit. Come on, somebody. When, when, when you're not eating food or you're not eating the food that you want, man, you're, you're, you're dealing with the flesh. But you're also increasing the spirit's control on your life. I'll think it like this. If you had two dogs that were getting ready to be in a fight, equal size, same breed, same training, and they're getting ready to fight one another, the question is, which dog wins? And the answer is, over time, the dog that you feed the most. And what we need to do is starve the flesh and feed the spirit. And one of the ways that we do that is through fasting. It increases the spirit of self-control. Where I begin to put a boundary on it. I begin to get a Holy Spirit, God-given authority over what I'm dealing with. Lust and anger and bitterness or whatever. Its power over me begins to diminish as I starve it, and the spirit of control comes over me. Here's another one, freedom. It says in Isaiah 58, Is this not the fast that I've chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every single yoke, the strength and the authority of sin? You know, even freedom has two parts to it. There's the freedom from and the freedom to. Sometimes when we think of freedom in, here in a, in a United States Western mindset, we can think of autonomy. Now, we can think I can do what I want, when I want, and how I want to. But the reality is that's not biblical freedom. Biblical freedom is the freedom from the power of sin. To, uh, it's the freedom from the power of sin to freedom to the power of the Holy Spirit. I am freed from this to be freed to that. It's freedom from and then freedom to a person. Because now I have no longer a slave to sin, the scripture says, but a slave to righteousness. I am under the control and power and influence of another. I am freed from this to be freed to the person and power of the Holy Spirit. It now He now has the authority over me. He now has the ability to call the shots on me. I am no longer under that way of thinking, but under the mind of the Holy Spirit. Freedom. And then the next one is this, confidence. And I think about in Acts 13, verse 2, and again, and this is faith as well. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them to do. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. You know what fasting always does is it brings clarity. It's hard to be confident with confusion. If you think about it, I mean, man, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? It's said that in a circus that they, um, a lion tamer um, was asked once being interviewed, if you were in the ring with a bunch of lions and you had to pick one but being without, which one would you do? Would you get rid of your whip or would you get rid of your chair? You ever seen it, man, where they put the chair in front of the lion and they're creating the sound? And, and he said, that's easy. I, I'd rather give up the whip and I want to keep the chair. And they said, why? Because really it's the chair that's the most important with its three legs, four legs. When we hold it up to the face of the lion, it doesn't know which one to fight or attack and it's paralyzed. But the reality is that it lacks focus. When clarity comes, you will have the boldness of a lion. That's what I love about this. They're in an atmosphere of fasting, prayer, and worship, and God speaks to them, and, and they have a bold move. You know why I love 21 days of prayer and fasting? Is God will speak something to you, and he'll speak it with an inner voice, an inner witness, an inner vision, and guess what will happen? You'll get a word from the Lord. And He'll cause a scripture to be highlighted, a promise to be given. And what you can do is you can begin to move with a boldness and a courage into a preferred future that God has for you with confidence. Regardless of what you're facing, 
You say, but I, I know it's like this, but God said this. And I'm just praying that in 2024, as we fast and pray, that you'll get a word from the Lord. Here's the next one. His power, and we close with this. We're getting ready to pray. It says in Luke 4, 14, this is after Jesus fasted and prayed that he returned to Galilee. He'd been there before. He had 40 days of prayer and fasting. He came back, and it says in the power of the Spirit, he came back. And news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. And then it says he began to preach, teach. He began to heal the sick, and he began to cast out demons. You know, when I, when I read that, it's so easy, especially the longer we've walked with Christ, to lead out of our experience and out of our giftings and not out of the anointing and the authority that the Holy Spirit can bring. But I love Jesus here, who, before he even goes in to perform his one miracle and cast out one demon, before he preaches his this great teaching, Sermon on the Mount, he begins with fasting, and the result is he had the power, the anointing, the authority, um, <clears throat> the boldness upon his ministry to heal the sick, to teach, and to cast out demons. You know, I just thought about this. What I'm praying for in 2024 in our church and those in our audience is this, is that there, this would be a season where we would see healing, physical, emotional, mental healing. And that we would see in new ways the activity of the enemy, the demonic activity, the strongholds of the devil defeated in a way that we've never seen them before because of the authority that the Holy Spirit can bring as we fast. So here's what I want us to do. I'm going to take, let's take a few moments and take off some wrong clothes and put some right ones on. Let's do this if we can. And take a posture of humility. I want you to uh, maybe put your hands out from your by your head and close your eyes as we just begin to pray here in these next few moments. And and, and whatever you got to do to create an atmosphere of prayer, you can go ahead and do that right now. But let's pray. And as always, I'm speaking to the first crowd, those that don't yet know Jesus. You're here and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, but you'd, you'd like to. You, you've got the the righteousness, your own righteousness. You, you've called your own shots and, and, and you've lived by your own authority and you've <clears throat> been an entity unto yourself, but now you realize you need to come under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you need to take those old clothes off and put on the robes of forgiveness of sin, the robes of righteousness. And you're here and you, you realize at the beginning of the year, I, I need a wardrobe change. And if that's you and you need to be born again, simply just invite Jesus and say, Jesus, I take those things off. Forgive me of my sins and clothe me in righteousness. Clothe me in the forgiveness of the Son. And as they're praying, let's just use this as a little prayer outline if we can. Come on, Christ follower, just say before the Lord, Lord, I humble myself before you. I choose to clothe myself in humility. Let humility of the Holy Spirit that the Spirit brings be in all my relationships, my marriage, my family, my working relationships. Maybe it's been something that you haven't put on, but put it on right now. This year, you're going to walk in humility. Righteousness. Maybe you've just been dealing with a whole lot of condemnation. Maybe you've just been dealing with some life-controlling, life-altering sins. And you want to do right now. You are right because you've been forgiven. You're in Christ. But now you need the power of Christ to be played out in your actions. Just declare to the Lord, Lord, I want to do the right thing. Lord, I, I want this year to walk in righteousness. Uh, Lord, I, I, I cast off the unrighteousness, and I ask you to clothe me in righteousness here in new ways. And maybe you've been forgiven, but you still have the residue of the past, the habits of the past, and you just want to say, you know what, Lord, I want to walk in freedom this year. I, I want you to take the grave clothes off. I want the habits. I want the thinking. I want the attitudes. I, I know I'm born again, but this year, take those grave and name them if you know them. That anger, that bitterness, that unforget, whatever it is, just say, Lord, I take it off. I take the great clothes off. And maybe pray for confidence even now. Maybe you've relied more on a strategy and, and, and a plan and all these things of the world. And, and nothing, sometimes nothing wrong with those. But you, 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 you have, it hasn't been a move of faith. There's not a confidence in the word of the Lord that God has given to you. I just pray, ask the Lord to open your ears during this season that he would give you a clarity 
to your calling, to your purpose, to your destiny, so that you can walk with a confidence and a focus this year.